Welcome to Conversations With. My name is Shaylee Hugendorn and I live with Bipolar 2 Disorder. Sharing with others is healing both individually and collectively. Sharing our stories will educate others, bring more understanding, shed more light and smash more stigma. Our voices need to be heard. Our stories aren't over yet. This is Bipolar. Hi everyone, welcome back to This is Bipolar podcast. I am ridiculously excited to have Sarah Fox come back. I was saying to my husband this morning how, um, just how it feels like a family reunion when I have people back again, which is so exciting. And um, I just adore Sarah and I love her podcast, Rough Edges. And I'm gonna ask her to introduce herself because y'all know I say it every time that I mess up introductions every time. As soon as I start, I forget everything about the person ever. So I am going to ask Sarah if she could tell us a few things about herself. Sarah. Yes, thank you so much for inviting me back. I'm so happy to be back. And so a little bit about me. My name is Sarah Fox, and I am a case manager slash transformational coach for youth in Brooklyn, New York. And I help them to find jobs and just really get back on track in terms of their uh, life experiences. I am also a podcast host of the Reference Podcast. Yes. And it is a mental health podcast that tries to find the intersection between faith and mental illness. And also it tries to uplift other voices so they mm -hmm. can learn more about these topics. And I am also a writer. I have my own blog with of my musings on like life and like you know faith and relationships justice like anything you name it <laughs> I write about it I love spoken word I do spoken word poetry <gasps> and I just love yes <laughs> and I also love to just explore with like you know traveling I don't do much traveling I want to and mm. I also love to try exotic foods from like different places in New York so yeah oh I'm also <gasps> <laughs> I love that. I love that. I learned more things about you. That's so exciting. I forgot to mention, if this is your first time listening, my name is Shaylee Hugendorn. Um, I live on the unceded territories of the Coquitlam and Katesy folks, which is also known as Port Coquitlam. And I live with bipolar 2 disorder. And Sarah also has bipolar. Okay. It's bipolar 1 or 2. Yeah one disorder yes and um if you want to know even more about sarah you can go listen we've done we've done another podcast also with our friend paris and so today um you i don't know if you could tell my voice but i'm a little bit nervous and so excited because we're doing something different today we are going to be talking about mental health in the black community and i wanted to first off say that I am a little nervous only because I don't want to say the wrong thing. And I know sometimes as white folks, we worry, we don't want to re-traumatize. We don't want to say the wrong thing. And I think that um, I just want to, I just noticed that Sarah was posting some amazing things for Black History Month. And I was like, yes, teach me. This is amazing. And I just asked her, do you want to come on? Can you share more with our community? Because I just think that this is such an important topic. And so, yes, Sarah, um, um, the first thing that I wanted to ask you is, before we start, as a personal thing, how are you since we last spoke? Yes, thank you so much for that. Um, since we, it's been a while since we last spoke, like around like last year in May. Yeah. So a lot has happened <laughs> in that time period. So first off, I got a new job. Before I was like an assistant manager at um, a real estate firm. And okay. now I'm actually more in line with what I want to do, which yeah. is case management for at-risk youth. And so I am loving it so far. It's very busy. It's a lot of work at times, but I really enjoy what I do. So that's been a huge highlight. 
And since then, I have also traveled to Orlando for the summer. And I was just like in awe of it because I've never been to Florida like at yeah. all. So I was just like, oh, this is nice over here, you know? <laughs> um, anywhere like outside of New York is like a good change of pace for me. So yeah, that's I awesome. really enjoyed it. Yeah. yeah. And next, you're going to come to Canada and visit me, right? Oh, yes. <laughs> yes. That's my next mission. <laughs> <laughs> and then I'll come visit you. I've always wanted to to go to New York. Um, oh, yeah. yeah, just so many things. That's amazing. Yeah. Mm-hmm. Well, shall we dive right in? Yeah, Let's, sure. awesome. Um, we I wanted to ask you um, some of the things that you were talking about in your opinion, because I realize that this is coming from your point of view. Um, what are some of the biggest obstacles in the black community when it comes to seeking help for mental health and or mental illness diagnosis? Yes. Yeah, so I well, I did a post on this on like my rough edges Instagram page, and it's kind of like just the the biggest like drawbacks in Mm. in terms of like African Americans and the Black community as a whole seeking out mental health. And so I would like to kind of break this up into two sections because as I was doing the research for this, I noticed that most of the reasons kind of overlap into two different sections. So it's one, it's like the beliefs about mental health as a whole. And the second section is the factors that play into just the barriers that are created when seeking mental health treatment. So the first aspect of the belief section is really like mental illness is often characterized as a weakness. Mm -hmm. And so this often leads like black people as a whole to believe that mental health, like having a mental health condition is a personal weakness. And it's due to the negative stereotypes of Mm -hmm. instability and attitudes of rejection that are often placed on black people. And it's even heightened when they have a mental health condition. And these quotes come from an article by Dr. Thomas A. Vance from Columbia University Department of Psychiatry. And he was saying that because of the lack of information about mental health issues in the Black community, Mm -hmm. it is not always clear when one may need help or where to find the help. So that's another element of the stigma that kind of creates a barrier. It's like, on the one hand, we don't want to be labeled as like, you know, inefficient, weak, you know, types of people. And then on the other hand, if we do want to seek help for it, it's just complicated because we don't have enough information about these issues in the Black community. Mm -hmm. And another aspect of just that weakness as a whole being stigmatized, this is coming from an article entitled Exploring Mental Health Stigma in Black Communities by Amy Mm -hmm. Morin, and it was like medically verified by Dr. Akeem Marsh. So the quote says, individuals in the Black community may be more likely to believe that since they've survived so much adversity, they're strong, and no one has the right to tell them that there is something wrong with them. So since they may view mental health issues as a weakness, getting a diagnosis will kind of shatter that stereotype because it is a stereotype of saying, oh, you're a strong black woman or you're a strong black man. And, you know, you're just you keep on going and you keep no matter what, not how, no matter how many times you get knocked down, you keep on getting up. And I think revolutionizing the way that we use the word strong in relation to like a lot of like the black community and what we deal with just I think it would just open a lot of the barriers and kind of see that I don't got to be strong all the time Mm -hmm. like I'm not superwoman (laughs) Like, like like I have moments of you know quote unquote weakness or just being human you know like I cry I I deal with bipolar disorder so you know that, <laughs> that. Um, so like I can't be strong all the time like I mm-hmm. can't there are some days where I just want to get knocked down lay down and not get up immediately <laughs> like that let's just be real so yeah. just shifting the focus of like 
being pressured to be that strong person and also fearing that the diagnosis is going to make you look inefficient, going to make you look weak. I think that's the first belief system that we got to attack if we're Mm -hmm. going to make people in the Black community more open to seeking mental health. And on the second belief system, it's really tied to more of the faith elements of it. Okay. So a lot of people in the Black community, and specifically speaking about my experience as well, we believe that prayer and faith are enough. Mm. We don't need anything else. <laughs> like, if you're going through something, pray about it. If yeah. you're having an issue, pray about it. Like, we don't need anything. It's prayer and faith. Those should be enough. And if it's not, it's seen as, oh, you're lacking that faith Mm -hmm. element. You don't have enough faith if you have this condition. And so going back to the Columbia University article, I love this quote where it says, in the Black community, there's often difficulty acknowledging psychological difficulties, but useful Mm -hmm. strategies include religious coping and methods such as pastoral guidance and prayer. They're often preferred as a coping coping mechanism for mental health. So even that in of itself is very interesting to me because while yes it could provide a great coping mechanism and speaking as a woman of faith myself it has helped me to be able to move on but there were so many moments where me myself I've had a conflict of like do I get medication do I seek therapy is it a lack of faith in God that I do these things and I just feel like there's nothing wrong with that. I mean, Mm. me being on medication now, I would say that it has helped me to regulate my moods more often, you know? I mean, it took a long way to get there. (laughs) Don't get me wrong. But it's been helpful. And I think when we lean so heavily into the faith aspects of it, we kind of negate the effects of medicine and good therapy and just you know things that can help being in a community like it's not just yes faith is in there but that's not the whole thing it's like you have other elements to kind of help you out and along those lines um even with another quote by Dr. Ann Nguyen she says that evidence suggests that the salutary sorry (laughs) no that's hard (laughs) effects of religion are stronger for blacks than for whites for example an investigation of religion and depression among older adults found that while black respondents who attended church more frequently saw a greater decline in somatic depressive symptoms church attendance was unrelated to somatic depressive symptoms among white respondents. So even with that level of research, we can see that prayer and church and just faith in general is such a huge factor in how people in the Black community cope with a lot of these issues. And the thing is, with the history of the Black church in America specifically, it has brought like a level of significance to people in the black community Mm. because while they were dealing with racism and feeling less than outside of the church in the church we are all on the same level we are all created in the image of god and so Mm. us going to church to handle a lot of these issues that we have it doesn't spawn out of just okay i'm just going to church because i don't want to handle it it's more okay church helps me feel better on the inside but I would just say as like a caveat to that it's like Mm -hmm. we only go to church once a week most times (laughs) so it's like when you get that feeling that week and then you go throughout the week and you don't feel good or you have those depressive symptoms how do you cope with it outside of that but we can talk about that a little later and yeah I'm gonna push into the factor side yeah 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 go ahead (laughs) That, that's really powerful. I'm excited to jump into that later. Also, um, you know, as a, as a woman of faith, I don't talk about like a lot of faith on here, but it's something uh, dear, near and dear to my heart. And so I'm excited. I'm excited to, to talk about that. That is really powerful. And so, so many things to talk about. So many things to think about. Yes. Thank you. Thank you. You were going to say, keep going. 
Oh yes. So I was just gonna <laughs> yeah. <laughs> bring up a couple of factors that kind yes. of contribute to the barriers. So one of the biggest barriers that black people in the black community face when it comes to mental health is just the pressure to suppress their emotions mm -hmm. from the black community itself. Mm -hmm. And so from that article, there was a quote from the Very Well Mind article where it was saying that other studies have found that the Black community is more inclined to say that mental illness is associated with shame and embarrassment. Mm. Individuals and families in the Black community are also more likely to hide the illness. And just on that point alone, I have experienced that myself, where mm. it's like, I don't want to be the member of the family with the problems, or I want to be able to be the legacy or create the life for my parents that they dreamed that we could create, you know? So mm -hmm. it's just that pressure to be like, you know what? I'm not going to even talk about this because I don't want to feel the shame. I don't want to feel the guilt. I don't want to be looked at differently. Mm -hmm. And then that also bleeds in to just the lack of poor treatment, the mm -hmm. lack of proper treatment. Yeah. And mental health services in the black community and going back to that very well mind article it says impoverished black people may be especially vulnerable to malpractice because many community mm -hmm. mental health centers hire who they can afford and not clinicians with better training and experience wow and so, yeah so that's like a huge issue with like just the type of treatment that we are given because when you walk into a situation where you need help with dealing with your internal state a lot of stuff goes into that it's like your mental it's your soul it's your you know your hopes and dreams and who you are as a person so when I go into therapy expecting to get clarification on all of those things and I have a therapist who just doesn't understand that type of lived experience yeah it's going to create a disconnect yeah so yeah that's really powerful I was reading something and I'm terrible with facts, but I remembered that it said something like 2% of a therapist. I wasn't sure if it said psychiatrist or therapist, and I know it works a little differently in the States than other places and in Canada, but it was saying something like 2% um, of therapists or psychiatrists are black. And I, uh, my mouth like dropped open that is that percentage is wild and I know I think we talked about one time just briefly in our past um, episode but I'd love to hear your experience in therapy um, I think you said you've you've had a white therapist and a black therapist and I'd love to hear um, kind of like what you personally noticed in the difference. Um, and if you did you seek out uh, a black therapist um, because of your experience with the white therapist? I don't know any of these things. And so I'm so curious to hear your personal experience. So yes, I had a white therapist before I had a black therapist. And having a white therapist, it was it was good, but the thing is, it's like I had it in a Christian context. Okay. So I had a Christian white therapist. So we mainly placed a lot of emphasis on Christianity over race topics, you know? Mm -hmm. And um, if we did speak about a racial issue, like let's say, because I was also at a predominantly white college. And so if I had an issue with something at the college, we would kind of talk about it and I would vent about it. Yeah. But I had to do a little bit more explaining about ah. you know why it bothered me so much. So um, yeah, there was that. And then racial subjects were kind of rationalized a little bit. So by that, I mean, it's like, okay, they kind of didn't mean it that way. You know, it wasn't the, mm. yeah. So, um, that's yeah. hard. <laughs> so I was just like, okay, I didn't really feel affirmed in my identity. I felt affirmed in my identity as a Christian, yeah. but not as a black woman and how that informed my experiences. And so I didn't actually seek out a black therapist until my manic episode in January of 2021, because yeah. 
my older therapist she she had moved so she couldn't really like treat me anymore because of the whole state jurisdiction thing so that's when I was like okay if I'm gonna get a new therapist yeah I'm gonna get a black therapist this time and <laughs> just see what the differences are and how that's gonna help and so I I loved it a little bit more I yeah. I loved them both about the same but having a black therapist really helped because she immediately understood like the racial trauma, the racial anxiety, the microaggressions that come mm. up here and there. Like she understood why I was annoyed at times. Yeah. And then when I graduated college, I my first job was in a real estate firm. So it really wasn't a lot of people who looked like me in that department anyway. Right. And so I was able to learn how to navigate being a black woman in predominantly white spaces and so I felt like my racial identity was affirmed and even in the light of a biblical context I was affirmed saying that you know God created me I'm fearfully and wonderfully Mm. made Psalm 139 and then I was just feeling validated like yes okay this is an aspect of who I am and it's not something that needs to be subservient to my biblical ideals you know like they can coexist yeah yeah yeah. I imagine uh, like also because in like I know we get a lot of free healthcare coverage it only goes so far with therapy or whatever like I think I get like five hundred dollars and it's a hundred and sixty dollars per session so it's not a lot but we do get that so I can imagine that you like you paying paying to have to explain your experience to your therapist seems wildly unfair (laughs) right I I I can imagine (laughs) that and I'm just wondering for our speakers that aren't um you know are just trying to learn things could you explain what a microaggression is and maybe um you know what you're comfortable with telling what that might have looked like in your life just because I know there's um you know a lot of uh, white folks that might not really truly understand that term yes of course so microaggressions are just like little phrases that may not seem racist like overtly racist Mm. but they slightly are you know so for example if I look at someone, I'm like, oh, you're pretty. You're pretty for a black girl. And it's like, <gasps> um, I'm pretty, period. Yes. <laughs> you know, like, yeah, you are. <laughs> so it's like, it shouldn't be like that. Or um, it's just like the subtle, the subtle things like, oh, are you sure you want to do like go for that position? I mean, you know, or just like elements of just like you're trying to disguise it as like okay I don't think you should do this or I don't think you should do that or you know like you're very smart for who you are and what you look like you know so it's just those little tiny backhanded compliments if you will yeah you know making you feel like okay so is it because I'm black that I'm pretty like you're shocked that I'm pretty because wow like or you know like yeah or your yeah. hair is nice and soft it's not kinky and you know wow. all those types of things yeah so yeah. that's an example yeah no I I know some um other uh black women that are f- like that I just adore and that I know have shared a lot about um about hair and I know yeah or just I know like can I touch your hair like no yeah. no <laughs> Or even right. like I notice, and it, it it's hard because when being called out, I know that a lot of people will. Well, I meant well. Well, that's not that's not enough, right? And I know um, something that I feel like terribly ashamed about um, was I know that when I was a, a, like a teenager, I remember saying like, "Oh, when I grow up." Uh, like I want to have a a black baby because they're they're cuter or something like that and I just feel like what I mean I was 16 so (laughs) right we know nothing at 16 (laughs) but also I think back about that and I'm like 
oh, and trying when I'm trying to undo my internalized racism and the systems that I've grown up in and the privileges that I have because of, of the color of my skin. So thank you so much um, for explaining that because I think, yeah, I just think that that's really powerful for people to understand. Yeah, oh, yeah. yeah. Question, um, going back to the stigma in the mental health communities, and then I'd love to talk about, about church, but you did an amazing uh, post about um, the stigmas in the, you know, your opinion, the stigmas in the uh, Black mental health community, and for that being so powerful. So my friends, she is going to tell us here, but go to her Instagram and answer that question because it's a beautiful conversation. And I was like, so grateful for that. And I, I've been checking back to see um, what other folks have been saying. So I'd love for you to, to speak about that, Sarah. Yes, of course. So I kind of mentioned a few of them. Mm -hmm. um, but the one that I didn't really mention is this one. So I didn't mention the fact that um, a lot of um, people in the Black community are more likely to get misdiagnosed. Oh, um, yes. Yeah, because of the lack of cultural competency and also because of the lack of the understanding of how racism and racial trauma affect um, Black people. So it's not to say that they get misdiagnosed because like, you know, mental health professionals are incompetent. It's just the fact that they don't understand, they might not understand why this particular thing is making you have such a strong reaction to it right. so the misdiagnosis really comes from a lot of the times it's like um just black people in general have had a history of being diagnosed as more of this like the more severe mental yeah. health conditions put it that way um okay. like schizophrenia and you know bipolar is often a, a very common diagnosis in the black community as well and I didn't find that out until I actually had bipolar disorder right right so um I was like oh okay this is interesting <laughs> um but yeah. yeah we tend to get those and depression is kind of like um a big one as well but we never really get like I don't want to say we never really get diagnosed, but we never really get like the, the generalized, like yeah. um, diagnoses, like anxiety or, you know, just like, um, like even ADHD, like a lot of um, younger black children, they get yeah. diagnosed more with ADHD than, yeah. you know, in comparison yeah. to white children. And wow. that kind of also, yeah, that kind of also creates the, the stereotype that black people are dangerous they're you know yeah. they're just more violent and angry and that is just not the case it's just that we've been labeled in that way so i didn't really talk about the misdiagnosis but yeah i wanted to point that out and another thing that i did want to talk about which you kind of highlighted before is the mm. financial barriers yeah so um there's a lot in america a lot of us have to pay for yeah. our health care, you know, it's not, we haven't gotten to the universal, like, free health care type of thing, so we have to pay for it, or if our insurance covers it, a lot of times insurance can only cover so much, you yeah. know, yeah. so it's just, like, you're still paying, like, even though you're not paying, like, hundreds of dollars at a given time, although some places you do pay a lot, um, if your insurance does cover it, they only cover a certain percentage. So you may not have to pay a hundred dollars, but you still have to pay like 75. Right. Comparison. So it's still like a lot. <laughs> and so yeah. a, a lot of um, people in the black community, they don't have access to those insurance agencies. And they also don't have good, like general healthcare um, providers to actually help them. Like we, we do have Medicaid here, um, but it's it's still creating like a, a significant barrier in yeah. terms of getting good treatment, you know, because yeah. you can get a free therapist, but that doesn't necessarily mean that it's going to be good, you know? Right. So, yeah. 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 Cool to bring up. I had never thought of that before. I was thinking about what you said, even just, um, you know, 
with bipolar in general, we're our, you know, it's already like, uh, you know, a mood disorder. So they're, they're, you know, they overreact, they, over, you know, they're, we get dangerous and all of those things anyways. And then there's those, what we've seen on television and what our society has told us. And then this, even though we don't want it there, this internal image that we have of, of black folks, I could see how they could be faster diagnosed as something like bipolar when really uh, you know the the anger is justified for what's yes. going on in this world and also not um also it being ignored as well because it's like oh you know that's just the way the way it is um in these communities and I find, uh, yeah, I find that really, really fascinating. And I was reading and y'all know me, I'm terrible with numbers, but the, I think it was like the average, I'm in this study right now in Canada in this, um, in one of the universities here, they're developing a, an app specifically for bipolar folks. So they want to hear things back, but they were telling me like, I think it's something like six to 12 years to get a proper um, bipolar diagnosis and I'm curious about with your which I, is horrible which I'm so excited that I'm interviewing younger people that they're finding out earlier mm -hmm. but I'm curious about your experience did you know about symptoms of bipolar disorder were you diagnosed with something else before had you um, sought help before you can hear in her Sarah's other episode about her manic episode that brought her to the final diagnosis. But I'm curious about those other things. Like what was your experience before your, um, you know, what your big experience that led to the diagnosis? Does that make sense? Yes. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> so like looking back on it, honestly, I, I wasn't really diagnosed with anything else and I didn't yeah. even know what like bipolar it wasn't even in my orbit you know right. so I yeah. was just thinking like oh I was just depressed or oh yeah. I was just angry or oh I was just anxious yeah um, and I never really got formally got a diagnosis until I had the manic episode which yeah. I was like 22 at the time so yeah. I mean I I have moments in my life where I look back on it like having this diagnosis I'm yeah. like oh I was probably manic or yeah. oh, I was probably going through a low cycle of bipolar depression so it, it it took a long time to say the least for me to actually really register the yeah. fact that I had bipolar disorder because when yeah. I first got the diagnosis I was saying to myself this can't be right like I'm just depressed I'm just yeah. angry I'm just yeah. anxious and when I learned more about it I'm like oh yeah I am actually <laughs> bipolar you know yeah. I didn't yeah. know about that until I actually saw a therapist and funny enough it was my white person therapist yeah. who was the one that was like hey maybe you should explore the possibility of yeah. you know, seeing a psychiatrist because even she in hearing my story was like yeah. you know there are some things that could be this but let's yeah. not label it yet you know yeah so yeah, there there was a there was a time where I can look back and pinpoint, especially during high school and like the yeah. early first years of college, where I'm like, yeah, I probably was bipolar the entire time. I just didn't know or couldn't. Yeah, because yeah, I think it's becoming more and more, um, you know, they always said it's always in your 20s or, you know, you're because we know bipolar disorder is a genetic thing. Um, and generally, um, you know, more rarely caused by trauma, it's, ju it's just in you, right? We know this, um, and runs in families. But I think that there's hesitation for um, doctors to say that it comes out in high school, or I think it gets missed because of the whole dramatic teenager thing. Right. right. But I can look back and I'm just like, yeah, I can see because I'm very cyclical. I can see those like I really wonder if I could have gotten a diagnosis uh, as a teenager. And I was reading, too, because I'm very aware because I have a family and I have children and I'm we're watching and being aware and educating things to watch for. And I read somewhere that um like the symptoms are different. And I read somewhere that teenagers, the symptoms comes out a lot in anger. So not so much in hyperactivity or not. And then also um, in girls, um, it's usually diagnosed as ADHD first. 
Mm. I thought that was really interesting. Oh, and as a teacher, I want to go back to your other part. Sorry, you brought up so many things in my brain. Thank you. This conversation is so rich. Um, I was thinking about how you said more Black children are diagnosed with ADHD. And I'm curious about, um, and I don't know if either of us can, can know for sure, but I'm curious if it's because of these internal stereotypes that even, uh, you know, white teachers have that they're more likely to think that that's, you know, uh, bad behavior or do you know what I mean? And so easier to jump to that conclusion, whereas some, uh, you know, some of my littles that I teach are just a little bit more rambunctious, right? But it's interesting Uh, Yeah, I'm going to look into that as a teacher because I want to be, I mean, I'm a substitute teacher and I actually worked, when I worked full time, I actually worked specifically with kids with um, learning disabilities. So I would love to unpack and learn more about that. So thank you for bringing that up. That's really, um, really fascinating to me. I wanted to, I know you touched on a few of them, but I'm wondering, lately I've kind of been exploring this idea of um, just these internal, like I'm even here, I'm a, you know, bipolar advocate. I know the things I'm asking people to look at their stigma and their, and then I'm realizing how deeply embedded that I still stigmatize myself. I was even telling you in the beginning of this, we were catching up and I was telling you about January and we were talking about how it was hard or whatever. And I was telling you how I was surprised (laughs) that I was depressed again and I was disappointed. And I was like, I teach people that healing is not linear, but my own self was like, how, you know, better or something, this, this voice in my, in like, not an audible voice, but like my internal critic was like, you know, better than this. And I'm like, what, what? And I'm wondering, I would just love to hear if you struggle with any internalized stigma still as a mental health advocate and and knowing what you know. Oh, yes. (laughs) Every (laughs) single day. (laughs) Right? Um, Right? Yeah, it is kind of funny just like having the, um, like the comparison between the two, because it's like one thing I know. Yes. That, you know, I know this information, like I, I researched it myself and try to learn about it. But at the same time, we're human, you yes. know, and we got to remember, like, you know, even though we know cognitively that healing is linear is, yeah. or it's not linear, it's like up and down in like a wave. Yes. We still, like feel like it should be, you know, yeah. <laughs> there's like, there's nothing wrong with that. And I also want to you know kind of highlight here too is that just the layer of like okay I should know this and I research this I talk about this I encourage other people about it like why don't I get it yet yeah it's just like you know it's kind of like that inner critic that you have and then also putting it in like a layer at least for me as a black woman just putting that layer on top of it where it's like oh you have to perform like you have to encourage other people you have to get back up like you can't be weak and tell other people that they have to be strong you know yeah. and so it's even that thing where it's just like in your head you're just like yeah. okay I know that I should give myself more grace but at the same time it's like yeah. you're still feeling within your heart it's like the cognitive dissonance it's like yeah you know it in your brain but in your heart it hasn't caught up yet so yeah. I'm, totally trying to, <laughs> I'm trying to think of it like an onion right if it's that just speaks to the years and the depth of the stigma and of the, you know, beliefs and of, you know, just how it's been perpetuated in, in society so that we also need to, to pull back those layers. And you spoke about that as well. Like, sometimes I get that because obviously, like I get dressed up to go on the podcast because I do the video. I, you know, I, uh, a lot of people say, well, you look, I'm quoting for people that are listening with my air quotes more put together or or such um but I still struggle and I find that I'm having the most connections on my Instagram when I show up in the messy middle right society tells us they love the story where it gets wrapped up in a bow right and I actually don't. In fact, I if, though a lot of the accounts that are like seem toxically positive to me make me feel worse because yeah. I am like, well, 
how come like I start to get into my head and like how come well they might they're all better they must be doing something that or know something that I'm not or I'm like a complete fraud as an advocate or as this but I think the beauty in advocacy and the the people that I truly believe like you that are teaching um going to teach people that don't understand or people even people that have um bipolar disorder is being in the messy middle because we try and say look we're going to live with this our whole lives right mm -hmm. so sh only showing up when things are good isn't going to actually help others understand right. and I mean there's there's a line there right like um you know I you know you have to be careful when you speak from a wound right you might not be ready you need to know these things and figure out with a therapist like you might be or not in a place to start a podcast, right? But telling right. one person, right? I call that advocacy. You don't have to be out there, um, you know, in this space. Um, but yeah, I get, I'm like, I hope that others listening, if you are an advocate or you, you know, are online, I, I just find that I connect or have more conversation when I show up. Like lately, the conversations about depression on because I am depressed right now, right? Mm -hmm. On my Instagram have had the most um interaction because yeah. and and like it's very hard for me to show up unshowered in a mess, right? And like <laughs> y'all, my hair. <laughs> I feel that I, like, you're right like I don't wake up in the morning with some of the straight girl hair right and I don't mean straight as in LGBTQ I mean as in like poker straight hair hair oh yes <laughs> right so it's it sounds ridiculous but it's hard for me to show up and it's been a real challenge and real healing for me to do a reel or to show up in stories and you know just a mess and yeah. yes I do the days that I just can't and I feel like I'm so vulnerable I do I'm not going to say that I don't use filters because I do I can only show so right. much vulnerability some days Same but thing. I love that you brought that up because I just want to give permission for you for me for everyone out there to show up in the messy middle and I love people that say I don't know right, right. Like I don't know right. like I just I learned lots of things I didn't know when we're non-symptomatic that it was called euthymia euthymia mm. I get it wrong every time euthymia I think euthymia yeah yeah I was like mind blown right and I, yeah, think, I actually have gotten that one uh, yeah like the, it, tell me that. <laughs> yeah, the just the um I want I don't want it's I feel like there's this pressure on the internet or on Instagram to be the expert yes. right and yes. also it's a slippery slope and I don't want to hurt anybody's feelings that do this because it's powerful or whatever but I'm skeptical about the word coach yeah right and we won't even go there but I'm skeptical about the word coach I just wonder if we can find out these find other words that there's not like a hierarchy because to me yes. a coach means like you know more or you're do you know what I mean and yes Yes, we can share our experiences, but I can't. And yes, I can, I am somewhat of an expert of my lived experience, but I'm not, I don't know if we can be an expert. Anyways, that was my like rabbit trail. But no, 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 just at that not, point though, yes, just at that uh, point real yeah. quick. I appreciate that. And the fact that we're even having this conversation is just amazing to me. And that is just something like when you asked me if we wanted to have the conversation, I'm like, Oh my God, like oh my. That's, it's just incredible. And the thing is, I'm not, I should have said this at the beginning, but I am not a representative of the entire um, African diaspora. <laughs> yeah, right? and I am not a licensed mental health professional. I am none of those things, but I can give you my lived experience. Yeah. I can give you the things that I research and learn myself. And like I was quoting these articles like just now, like I, I can go based off of that, but I feel like as an advocate, yeah. we need to start taking the pressure off of ourselves to yes. know everything about every single topic. <laughs> because that is not true you know it's like I can't tell you about Shaylee's life and yeah. you know Shaylee can't tell me about my life but yeah. we can tell the world about our individualized lived experiences so I just wanted to say thank you for yeah. that discussion oh, yes yes <laughs> amen to all those things amen to all those things okay I had some things I'm trying to think about um um 
I wanted to, I think it would be a whole other podcast, Sarah. I think we need to do a whole nother podcast on church. Oh, yeah. Because yeah. I just looked at the time and we've been like an hour. So I am <laughs> asking you right now if we can do a different one on church for our folks. Because I also know a lot of people have been deeply wounded. And I think that's my uh, fear about, uh, you know, I even say women of faith right now because of what's going on in the world about, you know, this idea of, of, you know, Christianity. So if you are someone that's been hurt by the church, um, I just empathize. And I know that Sarah and I really, the reason we talk about it is because we want things to change there. So I let's do that. Because I really wanted to get to the next two questions, um, which were, how can we come alongside and help or just start some change. Um, and I was saying before, without centering ourselves, if we are white, like, how can we, I hate it when people are like, and I know, in some re, in some ways, it works. But I know a big thing in the church is like, be a voice for the voiceless. And that is not in, in that is not it. When we are the voice for the voiceless, we are holding down other voices. And right. so I know there's so many of us that just want to help, want change, want to dig out our internalized racism. And I just love, in your opinion, what do what do you think would be supportive or what can what can people do? Yes, thank you so much for that. And I, I just think like having the conversations, that's a good start. Um, this right here, us doing this <laughs> podcast is a good first step. So, and the second thing I want to say is like, understand cultural competence mm. and why it matters in mental health treatment. So cultural competence is basically really quickly yeah. just... Um, learning more about aspects of another person's culture in yeah. order to help them move through the pain that they're dealing with. So if we understand like the cultural competence in America specifically about how racism has affected many people in the black community for like decades, then we can begin to understand what type of treatment that we need. And I would also say educate ourselves as I was mentioning before, about the history of racism in America and how it affects mental health. And the last thing I would say is to just reestablish community, mm. be more kind to each other, because I don't know what you may be going through on a daily basis, and you don't know what I'm going through. We need to be more kind. We need to be more compassionate and empathetic towards your fellow neighbor, because that can make a big difference. Yeah. Yeah, that's powerful positivity. And like you said, with your um, white therapist, like explaining it away. As white folks, we just need to believe Black people. Yes. And their stories, right? <laughs> right. No, right. I always tell my kids like, no good sentences start with at least. Yeah. It's invalidating. I ask them to take it out of our vocabulary completely, right? Or remind people, well, they had good intentions. Well, yes. that invalidates the person that's been offended or hurt right. or had. Yeah, um, I'm. Your, I I would love to hear. Yeah, just your thoughts about that. What do you think about at least? Or uh, how can we? Uh, like, I do you believe we should be able to change language as well? I'm just wondering if you could speak on that a little bit because I know sometimes. Um, uh, you know, in even in the internet space and in church everywhere, this toxic positivity, I find exhausting. And I would love for to hear what you think about that. Yeah, so thank you for that. And first off, I would just want to say that first off, yeah, believe when we say that, hey, this is racist, or it comes across to me as being very racially charged. And I mm -hmm. feel offended by that. I feel like we should be able to allow people to vocalize and actually call things what they are. And mm -hmm. I feel like a lot of the times toxic positivity, it's like, yeah, but, you know, and it's just not fair. And it's not really validating the fact that you see me and you understand. And I think a lot of that comes from just a lack of knowledge True. and a lack of just understanding what 
that particular person meant or what they said and how it affected you because a lot of the times we like to think oh he didn't mean it that way or everything's not about race and it's yeah. like well yes it is if you're telling me that I'm beautiful like at as a black girl and if you're telling me oh you're smart for someone like you and it's just like what do you mean someone like me you know <laughs> like what right? do you mean unpack that you know so yeah. I think you know, just addressing it and calling it what it is, yeah. is the first thing. And secondly, just having that person just have the conversation, just unpack that, confront that person and be like, okay, what did you mean by this? Because right. again, I'm not going to lie. Sometimes we do make it about race all the time. And sometimes it was just like a backhanded compliment, but that's why you have the conversation. That's why you confront them right then and there and say, Hey, what did you mean by that? Yeah, because I found that offensive. Please yeah. explain. You yeah. know, that's how you yeah. That. yeah, that's 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 really powerful. What did you mean by that? I know. Yeah, there are some people in my life that are like actually overtly racist, and it's interesting when you ask that question, it 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 backs it up a little bit, right? Instead of yeah. I want to go on the like, you know ally soapbox and then it shuts people down so yeah I love that you said that and also too we talked about earlier there's like a big uh, you know fear um with white folks to even bring it up even bring things up or saying the wrong thing I know I try to start with tell me if I'm saying the wrong thing or do you know do you know what I mean yeah. and what would be you know your thoughts or what would you say to white folks that want to to start talking about um you know black experiences in mental health or just black experiences in general what would you say to that yeah so first off i would say educate just do the research go into it so that way when those situations do happen yeah. you'll be able to automatically know like ah that was a microaggression yeah you know, like, and call yeah. it out for what it is. So I would say, educate yourself. And then secondly, as I mentioned before, have the conversation. Yeah, if yeah. you want to learn more about someone else's lived experience and don't make it obvious, like, oh, I want to learn more. So tell yeah, me, yeah, more, yeah. you know, <laughs> like, but just have a conversation like, hey, you know, I'm very interested in this aspect of, you know, well, I'm very interested in this aspect of you as a person. Why is this important to you? Why do you feel this way when someone says that about you? Like, why does it bother you? What, how do you feel about all the racial tension that's going on in America right now? Like, you know, yeah. actually start a conversation, like have a connecting point or a connecting question where you could just get more of what that person is living through and get more of like what they experience on a day in and day out basis. Because I think half the battle is just actually talking to people. Because yeah. <laughs> right? like a lot of the times it's like, the miscommunications and the assumptions they all come because we don't communicate so yeah I would just say educate and communicate those are the two things yeah yeah and that's going to lead me into my next question in a minute but also too don't expect like look around at who your circle is right if you're a white person and you have you know one black friend or like also, they might not have the capacity that might be re traumatizing that might be. Yeah. Uh, do you know what I mean? Like I tried yeah. to ask you if you had the capacity because it isn't like you said, educate yourself as a way the Google is there, right? We can't, <laughs> we can't put that on uh, black folks to teach us and there are um, people like people that I follow and other people can follow that um are anti-racist edu you know educators and have those spaces I feel like I know some of my friends have said like that's a lot of pressure like just you know there's a fine balance between teach me and tell me and demanding it right, right. and so right. maybe check check their you know your the your friend's capacity and see if you're in the circle to be able to ask that like Sarah's saying I'm open to it right but I can't expect everyone every black person to to teach me and even though I come with a good heart um it's it's putting on uh, you know a, a lot of pressure so I am so grateful 
Um, I'm so grateful that you said yes. And I'm, my heart is so full and I want to just go out and, and Google all the things and learn, learn more things and share, share more on, um, on my platform so that people, people can learn. So my very last question is what are some people that you suggest that we follow for, for anything? That's the thing too, is also not just follow, like follow for, to celebrate black joy and black success. And, you know, sometimes there's, you know, we're just looking at, at one thing. So any black uh, voices that you could recommend for my listeners would be um, wonderful. Yes, of course. So um, it was kind of lengthy, but um, I'm just going to go rapid fire. Yeah, so, we'll put it in the show notes. Yeah. Okay. Okay. So Dr. Monica A. Coleman. Yeah. She is incredible. Um, I would say also Truth's Table. Yes. She wrote a book <laughs> called My Polar Faith. <laughs> and I will also say Truth's Table. They're another great um, platform. Dr. Christina Edmondson and Akemini Wan. They are great. Check them out. Dr. Atasha Jordan, she is a psychiatrist that um, specializes in um, just trying to intersect faith and mental health, especially yeah. in the Black community. And I would also like to highlight Jamie Grace and Morgan Harper Nichols because yes. they're killing it um, in terms of like, just even talking about autism and yes. um, the Black community. So that's great. Um, I also have Bianca Cotton, who is the host of Behind the Confident Smile podcast, Ooh. and she does a lot of, like, talks about faith, mental health, Blackness, so really check her out. Uh, Kobe Campbell, she is also a psychotherapist, she's a trauma therapist, and she has a podcast called The Healing Circle, which uplifts mm -hmm. Black people as well and their experiences, and then two more. Yeah. Um, Therapy for Black Girls, most definitely. Nice, um, yeah. And uh, lastly, Rebecca C. Wirtz. She is also a therapist, and she's a speaker, writer, and she also covers the Blackness, faith, and mental health as well. That's amazing. Yes, we will put in the show notes. And didn't you just interview someone from Truth's Table? I think I saw yes, that. I yeah, did. you did. <laughs> that was my most recent episode. Um, it's called Hope Heals, Reframing Race faith and mental health check it out guys yeah check it out for sure and yeah I'll put it in the show notes and I think when Sarah gives me the list um I I think I'll do an, a specific Instagram post so it lives somewhere as well for folks to go check it out so oh. go and follow Sarah um she is doing wonderful work friend I am just in awe of the uh, work that you put in the world, your heart and your soul um, in, in everything you do. And I'm so grateful that we're friends. I was even telling my husband, I, if you look at Sarah's stuff, it's uh, she likes purple. And so I wore my purple shirt for you. <laughs> and yes, thank you. Thank you. Thank you. And I know Sarah's open to questions and I know her DMs are open. If you have um, you know, questions for her. Also, for our future episode that I literally told her that she's doing with me <laughs> in the church, if she's willing. Um, if you have any questions, churchy questions or questions for our experiences and such, um, watch for that to come in the future. I'm starting to do hopefully some more topical um, and uh, almost panel podcasts as well. So thank Ooh. you, Sarah. Thank you so much. This is Bipolar. Thanks again for tuning in. You can find video versions of This is Bipolar on our YouTube channel. We also have all our previous and soon to be future episodes of the podcast on Apple, Podbean, Spotify, and Google Play. We spend most of our time on Instagram at this.is.bipolar. There is a vibrant community there where we have conversations and post different ideas and different strategies. And we'd just love for you to join us there. It is so helpful if you enjoy our work or think it would be helpful to someone if you could like and share and save and follow us in all or any of those spaces. If you're a listener for the podcast, if you could leave a review, we would be 
forever grateful. Again, thank you for being here with us. Let's get the word out. Let's share lived experiences so that we can change the ideas that people have about bipolar and help those of us that live with it feel less alone. This is Bipolar. Thank you.